Thank you very much for the invitation. Today, I'm going to share with you recent research from my laboratory on advancing single cell proteomics and some applications of discovering new biology with, with the technology. Why do we want to measure proteins in single cells? One of the most apparent reasons for that is the diversity of the cells that make up our bodies as clearly evident when you consider the tumor cell encrusted by lymphocytes here, they, the, the two cell types differ very significantly, morphologically and similarly, as we differentiate different cell types from embryonic stem cells, we see these dramatic morphological differences. In some cases, however, we can have significant molecular and functional differences between cells that look very similar as shown here with these melanoma cells uh, that are morphologically uh, similar, but nonetheless are functionally and molecularly different. And I'm going to give you one such example today with the emergence of priming for a drug resistance of melanoma cells. Similarly, macrophage polarization is another example of significant functional and molecular heterogeneity in cells that don't change so much morphologically. Other examples that I will not talk about today include T cell exhaustion, cellular senescence, and, and many other conditions. Of course, the, the most widely used technologies to study uh, such single cell heterogeneity is RNA sequencing, which is very high throughput, very powerful method, but there are important biological aspects that are not captured by this technology. Uh, as one example, consider the levels of P53 messenger RNA measured by two different methods, either RNA sequencing or qPCR. Uh, the two methods agree with each other, more or less, but they're very different from the protein levels of P53 measured, again, with two different technologies. Again, we see agreement between the technologies for measuring proteins, but difference between the protein level and the transcript levels. And we have seen in our own research, as shown here on the right, that this can be detected and has consequences for single cells. In particular, we see that when we measure P53 protein and RNA in single cells using, using mass spectrometry, there is very little coordination at the, between the transcript and the protein level. And we find that the protein level is informative for the transcription factor activity while the RNA level is not. More generally, I'm very interested in being able to use high, highly accurate, highly precise protein measurements across many, many single cells to distinguish between different classes of models uh, that can explain biological phenotypes. As shown here with these diagrams, we can use the joint distributions or the joint distributions condition on confounders to discriminate between different biological mechanisms and explain in more details here in, in the references below. Of course, there are many challenges to doing high throughput, inexpensive, high accuracy protein analysis. And many colleagues have joined forces and contributed to overcoming these challenges by developing synergistic solutions as sketched here in, in this cartoon from a review that they published last year. And this cartoon is already outdated, which is a good example, a good demonstration uh, for the speed at which the field is moving. Uh, next, I'm going to tell you about some efforts from my laboratory to advance experimental designs, data acquisition, and interpretation that they're contributing to, to this uh, synergistic jigsaw puzzle here. Uh, starting with sample preparation, though, that's an essential step that I would like to address. It's a step that uh, used to be a substantial bottleneck for us in the early days, especially in terms of throughput. And from the very beginning, my dream was that we can do the sample preparation in droplets on flat surface at very, very high density. And Andrew LeDuc, a doctoral student in my laboratory, helped realize his dream by developing uh, a method using the, the Selen one as one embodiment, as one implementation. 
that allows depositing tiny droplets on a fluorocarbon coated glass slide in any geometry that we want. This is programmatically controlled, so it is very easy to uh, instantaneously change it. Uh, and we can, and each of these droplets can serve as the, the container in which we are going to prepare a single cell. Uh, they extract proteins, they ingest them, label if desired, merge them together, and so on. And as shown here in this panel, we are able to increase the density between these droplets and prepare thousands of single cells in parallel. And this is one of the one of the aspects that we like of, of this approach of being able to inexpensively prepare a large number of single cells at the same time. Uh, and here we have sketched some of the details uh, that uh, of steps that, of course, most of you are familiar with, necessary for doing sample preparation. The one aspect that I'll, I'll emphasize here is that uh, all of these steps are uh, done in uh, droplets that have volumes below 20 nanoliters. Some of them are much smaller, like the DMSO droplets in which we lyse the cells. Uh, and then at the end of the experiment, the instrument automatically pulls all the single cells that are labeled in the same set and transfers them into a multi-well plate that then can be positioned into an autosampler of an LCMS system and, and be analyzed. A couple of uh, um, figures of merit for doing sample preparation with NPOP are shown here. One of those is the efficiency of delivering peptides from single cells to the mass analyzers. We estimate this to be about 95% of the efficiency of delivery from a bulk sample using uh, composed of thousands of cells. Uh, and another aspect is the, the background associated with doing this very small volume sample prep. We always include control samples. We call them negative controls. They're, uh, they do not have single cells because we want to measure how much signal is present if we add all the reagents that we normally do and do all the manipulations that we normally do, but don't have a cell and don't expect signal. And in the case of NPOP, we see that the uh, signal measured from negative control droplets is zero. We don't detect any intensity there while uh, the signal measured from single cells is substantial. Uh, we see that we have very low ion current coming from singly charged ions shown here in pink compared to two and three plus charged ions that likely correspond to peptide-like features. And these data are acquired without using any ion mobility uh, frames or any other uh, uh, device suppressing the uh, singly charged ions. Now, moving closer to the mass spec analysis, the first question that we asked ourselves a long time ago was, so what's present in a single cell prepared for mass spec analysis? How many peptide-like features are present? And the answer to this question is really quite encouraging. We can detect over 60,000 peptide-like features spanning a wide range of abundances from a single cell analyzed by mass spectrometry. And the natural question then becomes, how do we assign confidence sequences to these peptides, both amino acid sequences and corresponding modifications, if any? And one of the obvious challenges that uh, will become clear is that it is uh, that the mass spec instruments are limited in time to analyze all of these peptide-like features. This is particularly the case if we use data-dependent acquisition, where we isolate and fragment a single precursor at a time. This approach, of course, is widely used with bulk samples and works reasonably well. Uh, because we need only short accumulation times for each precursor, but as we go to lowly abundant samples in single cells, we need longer accumulation times. And then we are able to take only about 10,000 or so MS2 scans. And of course, generally in a shotgun analysis, not all MS2 scans are reliably assigned to amino acid sequence. So we may be identifying half of them. And we wanted to to implement several improvements. Uh, specifically, we wanted to uh, merge this dashed curve with a solid curve. We wanted to, if possible, assign a confidence sequence to every MS2 scan taken. 
we wanted to spend our limited instrument time on the precursors that are biologically most informative and important for our analysis. And we wanted to have very high data completeness. We wanted to solve the problem of stochasticity inherent in shotgun uh, data dependent acquisition. So towards this goal, towards this goal, we developed prioritized data uh, acquisition. Uh, using the MaxQuant Live software to control all kinds of orbit sharp instruments. Uh, and uh, many of you are familiar with that idea of changing the heuristic from picking the end most abundant precursors to picking those uh, precursors from an inclusion list. But one challenge with this approach that we identified in early on is that if our inclusion list was very large, and then the instrument would run out of duty cycle time and we are going to end up having low data completeness. If our inclusion list is not very large, then our coverage is not going to be maximal and we're not going to have full duty cycle time. So to overcome this challenge, we developed this prioritization approach where the inclusion list is divided into different priority tiers and those priority tiers dictate the logic, the sequence in which precursors are selected for uh, fragmentation and MS2 analysis as shown in this cartoon here. Does it make a difference? Uh, one control experiment to benchmark the difference that it makes is shown here in panel B, where we look at the data completeness of MaxQuant Life without prioritization, shown with the gray bars, and MaxQuant Life with prioritization with the red bars. We see that indeed there is a very high degree of uh, data completeness when we apply the prioritization heuristic, the prioritization approach. And this is not at the expense of lower coverage. We see that in fact, prioritization increases a little bit uh, protein coverage per single cell. And if you look at what the instrument is doing, it's implementing exactly the logic that we expected, specifically detects the precursors from the inclusion list across all tiers um, at very high efficiency. It sends virtually all of the high priority ones for MS2 analysis. It sends the majority of the, of the medium priority for MS2 analysis and sends very few from the low priority ones. Uh, and all of these data shown here are acquired from 60 minute active gradient and using relatively narrow MS2 isolation windows because we wanted to minimize co-isolation and co-fragmentation of, of ions in this case, since we're using isobaric mustaks. Uh, this approach is particularly effective with very challenging precursors that are normally detected in a very small fraction of the shotgun runs. And here we tested prioritization with one, one such set of challenging precursors. And you can see that uh, the white space corresponding to missing data is dramatically reduced when you use prioritization. And in fact, it's reduced uh, about threefold compared to the shotgun analysis. And these benefits scale to all levels of priority as you can see here, looking at all proteins that we quantified uh, in, uh, in the single cells with prioritization, we have 94 level, 94% 94 data completeness. Um, how about the depth of the protein coverage when using prioritization? Uh, first, we can look at how we are doing in terms of interpreting MS2 scans. We go from about 40% successful sequence assignment with shotgun to almost 90% sequence assignment, more than two times higher success rate of assigning sequences. And this about doubles the number of peptides that are uh, robustly identified in single cells. Uh, and the same is true for proteins. We see a very substantial increase in the protein coverage simply by changing the logic of data acquisition. Uh, you can see that one consequence of that is also the increased sensitivity and dynamic range of proteome coverage. So here in blue is shown the distribution of precursor abundances measured by shotgun uh, data dependent acquisition. And the red is from exactly the same samples from the same batch, but analyzed with prioritization. And you can see that there is a range of abundances that are not even sampled with uh, data-dependent acquisition with shotgun analysis 
uh, that they're quantified with prioritization. But how accurate are these data points? We wanted to have a rigorous benchmarking of the accuracy, and that's why we spiked in peptides, synthetic peptide standards, at levels comparable to the abundance of the proteins in single cells. And we observe very good agreement between the spiked in amounts and the measured amount of these synthetic peptides, which we attribute to uh, being able to uh, MSMS very close to the illusion peak because of the accuracy of the real-time uh, retention time alignment. And we also attribute to the narrow isolation windows that reduce co-isolation. Of course, they don't eliminate it. And the next approach that I'm going to tell you is about quantification that is not um, a single cell proteomics approach whose quantification is not affected by co-isolation and co-fragmentation of precursors. And that approach, again, is motivated by the observation that we have a large number of detectable precursors, and we cannot identify, we cannot analyze all of them with sequential uh, data-dependent acquisition. So we wanted at least to analyze some with parallel acquisition, where we isolate hundreds, thousands of precursors at the same time. And as we did that with data-dependent acquisition, we wanted to simultaneously multiplex, increase the number of single cells that can be analyzed as part of the same sample simultaneously, and to enhance our ability to identify sequences, because simply collecting fragments from all the precursors does not equal identifying their sequences. There remains a challenge there. And we were motivated by this possibility, by this theoretical model that if we analyze in parallel multiple samples, and if we analyze in parallel multiple peptides, we can multiplicatively increase the throughput of uh, highly accurate quantitative data points. And here you can see uh, the, the corresponding data points to 18 plex TMT uh, experiment, a label-free DOA, and the possibility of increasing further the throughput by using uh, multiplexing. Uh, to test this hypothesis, we used a threeplex non-isobaric mustad, and we prepared uh, an experiment using the classical and, and well-established approach in, in our field of mixing the proteomes of different species into known ratios. And the samples were either analyzed by label-free data independent acquisition, or they were labeled with non-isobaric mass tags, in this case three, and the labeled peptides were mixed and analyzed as, as one sample using three times less instrument time. We observed that the number of data points uh, acquired was about three times higher when we use this non-isobaric multiplexing and the computational framework that we developed for uh, analyzing, interpreting the data. And the data overlap was much higher for the Plex DI samples, which resulted in quantifying larger number of proteins across all three samples, even though we used three times less instrument time. And here you can see other quantitative metrics, the, the jacquard index of very high overlap of the proteins that are quantified across the different samples. Uh, and very, very low level of missing data. But of course, this exercise is not about acquiring just data points. We want accurate data points, and our experimental design allows us to evaluate the accuracy of, of Plex DA by comparing the mixing and the measured ratios, and we observe that uh, there is very good agreement giving us confidence in, uh, in the quality of Plex DA data. One very important aspect that we spend a lot of time and paid much attention to is uh, developing empirical uh, benchmarks for sequence propagation within PlexDA sets. And here we benchmarked it by having samples in which we had two mixed species or only one species, and we made sure that empirically we only identify proteins from the species present in a sample, not from the, from the one that is not. And this works very well in, in, in our benchmarking experiments, both at the MS1 and at the MS2 level. 
Of course, our motivation for developing PlexDA in large part included doing single cell analysis. And here you can see example of raw data from PlexDA uh, for uh, a peptide whose sequence is shown here on the top, measured in a single pancreatic adenocarcinoma cell and measured in a single monocyte. Uh, with the data points, individual data points corresponding to survey scans. And then, of course, we fragment, we uh, isolate and uh, fragment these peptides, and the MS2 fragments nicely align with the corresponding precursors. And here you can see examples of, of other precursors, including very lowly abundant precursor that would have been difficult to quantify without PlexDIA. On average, we detect about a million uh, copies of, uh, of ions per single cell and uh, median about 30 copies or so per peptide, which compares quite favorably to what can be done with single cell RNA sequencing, something that we have many times emphasized from the early days. Uh, one aspect that I find particularly gratifying for PlexDIA is the ability to assign a confidence interval to individual measurements based on the fact that uh, we can quantify the relative abundance of a peptide in single cells based on multiple uh, MS scans. And for example, from the precursors, we can have three estimates of, uh, of relative abundance. From the fragments, we can have another three estimates. And the degree to which those estimates agree with each other uh, indicates the level of, of confidence that we can have in, in the data, the level of consistency that we have in the data. Zooming out from the raw data, here is a plot for the quantification now of hundreds of proteins in uh, both single cells, their relative abundance between PDAC and monocytes. Uh, to different cell types and the relative abundance measured in bulk, we see a uh, very good agreement and see very wide dynamic range, which is wider than what we could obtain either by label-free uh, analysis of single cells or by multiplexing with isobaric mustaks. With this brief um, introduction to the technology, I'll quickly share with you some of the biological applications, starting with analysis of primary macrophages. We treated primary macrophages with LPS and analyzed both untreated and treated cells. Um, as a first low bar of analysis, we can very easily identify which single cells were treated and they separate on PCA plot uh, in agreement with bulk samples from the corresponding treatment condition. And then some sets of proteins show very homogeneous abundance within a condition and difference between the conditions. Type 1 interferon signaling uh, shows low levels in the untreated cells, high level in the treated cells, and we did not need single cell analysis to we did not learn anything new for interferon gamma. We did not need single cell analysis to analyze it. But interestingly, phagosome maturation shows variability within a condition uh, and not just difference and differences between the conditions. So we were intrigued by this and examined whether this molecular heterogeneity has any functional uh, ramifications. So we measured what is the phagosome uh, activity in those um, primary macrophages using an assay for fluorescently labeled dextran uptake. And we were able to identify large number of robustly differentially abundant proteins associated with the functional difference in phagocytic activity, and then link back these data to the molecular heterogeneity in the single cells. One other aspect of the prioritized analysis that we used for this study here is that we are able to prioritize post-translationally modified uh, peptides, in this case, proteolytically cleaved. And that's important because many of the important regulatory mechanisms in primary macrophages include prote uh, proteolysis. We validated the method using uh, established classical bulk assays and then performed the, the single cell measurements of these proteolytically cleaved peptides. Switching gears here to another biological project where we examined drug resistance in melanoma cells uh, using a widely used model system in the field uh, where uh, previously colleagues have, have observed the emergence of jackpot cells that are primed for, for drug resistance. 
So in that system of melanoma cells, we, we coinalized with monocytes. Of course, the two cell types are very easy to tell apart. That's a low bar. But we also observed this second cluster in the melanoma cells that we were curious about it. These, uh, these measurements that I'm showing here use prioritized analysis, P-scope that they introduced. So we, we wanted to investigate if this cluster is real by using a different kind of mass spec measurement. So we use PlexDI. And when we compare the two data sets together, we see that there is an excellent agreement uh, in the two measurements in identifying uh, the same two clusters, which gave us much confidence that what we are measuring is biology and not technical variability in the measurement. And furthermore, we can take this comparison one step further and be more rigorous and ask how similar are the relative protein levels measured by prioritized scope and by PlexDA between the two uh, clusters. And in this case, we are comparing relative protein levels in biological replicates measured months apart. In one case, we used MS2 reporter ion intensities. In the other case, we used MS1 precursor intensities. And we still observed a uh, good agreement of correlation of about 0.7 between these biological replicates. And then now that we have confidence in these clusters and their biological origin, we examined what is the underlying biology and we identified that the smaller cluster uh, has high abundance of markers that were previously associated as emergence of, of uh, priming for drug resistance, while the large cluster corresponds to cells, melanoma cells expressing with high level non-primed markers. We also could detect uh, the high abundance of senescence markers. Uh, so here are the, senes the, the senescence-related proteins and protein secretion in the cells that are primed for resistance, while we had high abundance of proteins related to cell division in the non-primed cells. And in fact, we could see a difference in the amount of time that these cells spent in the uh, G1 phase of the cell division cycle. But not only that, we could actually identify uh, functional groups of proteins that show different co-variation across the phases of the cell division cycle between these two clusters, cluster A, which is the non-primed cells, and cluster B, the primed cells. Interestingly, we observe that the protein content uh, is correlated to cell diameter, of course, as one would expect, but the uh, cluster B cells tended to have less protein content for the same cell diameter, which is shown more quantitatively here. That led us to hypothesize that perhaps these cells uh, from cluster B have more glycogen, they store reserved carbohydrates, that's a known phenomenon that happens with slowly growing cells, and consistently with that, we observed that uh, they perform less glycolysis. But then we performed the direct measurement of glycogen, and we observed that indeed cluster B cells have higher abundance of glycogen. We further examined protein covariation of proteins within these different clusters. And here you can see example of proteins that robustly covary and differ not only between the clusters, but within each cluster of macrophage cells. And we were able to identify functionally enriched groups of protein exhibiting this covariation, such as this gradient of proteins involved in either glycolysis or oxidative phosphoryl phosphorylation, where some cells within this large cluster A have performed more glycolysis, while other ones perform more oxidative phosphorylation, forming a gradient of covariation. And this is even more evident and uh, quantitatively established by performing a PCA analysis in the space of differentially abundant proteins between clusters A and B. And one aspect that gave us much confidence in this analysis is the fact that the cells analyzed by PlexDI and PSCOPE fall on top of each other, uh, therefore cross-validating the measurements by, by those different methods. Uh, all of the data that they presented today, plus much more data, are available from uh, our uh, data web portal. And I would like to invite you to, to download and reanalyze them. And if you cannot find something, let us know. We'll be happy to provide it. 
we provide not only the data, but also the metadata, which we think is very important for reanalyzing the data. We think that the current state of the technology is very exciting because it offers the prospect for tremendous gains, both in terms of increasing the depth of protein coverage, quantifying many modifications in protein activities, not just protein abundances. And because the possibility of using Hyplex DIA offers the potential to increase the throughput while preserving the high quantitative accuracy and precision of the measurements, and I have uh, shared uh, in, in these perspectives our ideas and vision for how we can do that. And we are fortunate that these uh, potentials are noticed by funders who have supported us for establishing a new research institute in Boston. It's going to be a focused research organization that is going to have a technology platform enhancing the single cell proteomics by mass spectrometry. Uh, and also flagship biological projects. Uh, we'll have a lot of funding and an excellent team, but we are still looking for more people to join us. And I would like to extend an invitation to those of you who are interested in this area to, to get in touch with us and, uh, and discuss possibility for joining us. As the field matures and more people are joining it, there is a growing interest in uh, learning how to perform the experiments that we have done and establishing best practices. So we worked with leaders in the community to establish an initial set of recommendations that you can find from, from this website here. Uh, and you can also contribute your recommendations using this Google form. We, we very much look forward to engaging in a robust discussion that helps the community grow on, on robust foundations. Uh, lastly, uh, I know that we are enjoying very much this meeting today, but with the speed with which our field is moving uh, six, eight months from now, we'll have many new results to discuss. And I would like to invite you uh, to the Single Cell Proteomics Conference in Boston in, in June uh, to join these discussions and present your work. Uh, everything that they presented has been made possible by this collaborative team having a lot of fun with single cell proteomics. And in particular, the Plex DA was developed by Jason Dirks. Uh, NPOP is, and the melanoma work was performed by Andrew LeDuc. And Gray Huffman developed the prioritized analysis and, and applied it to primary macrophages. I would like to thank the funders who made the work possible, in particular funding from the NIH Directors Award and the Allen Distinguished Investigator Award from Paul Allen Frontiers Group. Uh, I'll stop here and I'll be, I'll be happy to answer your questions.